Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm just like texting to my colleague because I mean she also wanted to to join, but she has some troubles. Oh. Yeah, I think she's the one waiting in the in the lobby, but she's not able to join. But it's fine. So, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, Nuria, thank you very much for the invitation for the lecture. And um, can you hear the noise at the moment from the background or not? Is it fine? Yes, a little bit, but it's fine. Yeah. yeah, because there is like a construction sudden and just immediately now started to work. So. <laughs> Amazing. But anyway, I mean, here we are. This is the Dust Institute. And Dust Institute is a collaborative platform and a community space in the center of Vienna, founded uh, in 2020 by me. Uh, by profession, I'm an architect uh, and researcher, uh, as well as my colleagues are architects and researcher. And Dust Institute is uh, basically investigating questions uh, related to the environment by various formats, including exhibition, public workshops, and intervention in the public space. Um, but to introduce somehow what we are doing or how Dust Institute has developed, um, it was mostly influenced by my personal experience with uh, Hong Kong, where I did part of my studies. And it was basically the experience of the climate uh, because I strongly remember the very first moment of this kind of like excitement being there in the very hot summer air that is so humid that it's almost impossible to breathe. And this kind of novelty for my senses uh, redirects my attention to the air condition of Hong Kong territory. And uh, somehow I got fascinated by these gradual effects on how my body, how it influenced uh, my body and the cultural habits. So while I was exploring the city, I noticed that in some, some areas and I not only have the breathing difficulties, but after a while I was developing a slight uh, headache followed by dizziness and also lack of breath. And uh, very surprisingly, these areas have been the prominent public spaces on the waterfront of Hong Kong Central District. And as I found out through my research, uh, they have been contaminated with low oxygen air which is coming from the underground ventilation systems. And these outlets have been carefully hidden in a public space as uh, benches. But in order to somehow analyze the site, I tried to visualize the invisible contamination with architectural drawing. So I drew so-called cross section of the city and I tried to draw as many processes happening on the site as possible in order to develop some have a more holistic approach in architecture analysis. And I was inspired by this drawing by William Heath that represents uh, contaminated water of Thames River, um, but showing another invisible aspect of the water quality, which is uh, hidden from our senses and perception. And as I have tried to transform this invisible air toxicity in my drawing to a visible one, this process of transformation fascinated me so much that um, I decided to build a prototype for the city intervention and turn our attention to the invisible toxicity of the air we breathe. So I developed my own device, which was plugged onto the ventilation outlet and was inflated by the vent air. And I let passersby to experience low oxygen and or on their own. And somehow I provide this kind of an utopia to experience the future air of Hong Kong. And unfortunately, a few days after this intervention, I got really sick and I got sick from breathing this polluted air inside my device in a way that I was not able to even climb the stairs, walk or talk to people. And the breathlessness basically take over my body and uh, my life and also, as you can imagine, the emotions. And these moments of breathlessness uh, for a long time navigated my attention towards the relationship between the visible and invisible, because this very present personal experience of air toxicity started my fascination with this small invisible matter that floats and interacts with and all around us. Um, but when we look to, back to history, the mystification of such a matter begins with Lucretius and his uh, so-called atomic cosmology, because according to him, uh, the word consists of indivisible first bodies 
floating in the cosmos of particles which interact, collide and uh, bring things to existence. But ancient science refers to this material as ether and in Greek ether means pure, fresh air, as a pure essence that the gods breathe it, filling up the spaces in between the other things. And this diagram by Robert, Robert Flatt um, represents such a thinking, uh, basically holistically approaching the definition of the world, where ether is the material invisible to us. And in order to approach such a topic from like holistic and global perspective, um, one needs to understand uh, the relationship between the scales and ether consists of. And in my opinion, the powers of 10 movie might be a tool for imagining these processes because the movie starts on the scale used by the humans, first expanding from the Earth to the entire universe and then uh, zooming invert until a single atom is observed, redefining our understanding of smallness and the world which is completely hidden from our perception. Um, and of course, current pandemic brought up question of the relationship between small and invisible versus the visible, because the last year we learned that the most dangerous enemy is the invisible one, which affects the human population on a global scale, although it's just restlessly floating in the air. So it is basically the particulate matter that function as a carrier for many biological and chemical contaminants, such as uh, viruses that float in the air for hours, days, or even week, and all depending on the ever-changing atmospheric conditions. But during our life, we inhale 18 kilograms of such, a, such airborne dust, and uh, we are not able to feel and perceive it. So I created an artwork as a physical and uh, tangible representation of such an amount of aggregated dust called 18 kilograms of dust. Um, but we are somehow not able to perceive the time and scale on which airborne dusts operate. And this diagram from the Rome project, I don't know if you know the publication called Limits to Growth, represents uh, how most of the population are able to think and perceive in the scale of the single family and in the time frame of the next week but only rare individuals located here on the upper right corner of the graph are able to perceive global environmental problems on a time scale exceeding their own lifespan. So therefore we somehow start to work with this very key, very crucial and key, key question for us in what ways can art deploy scientific tools to lift our view to another level of understanding to help us navigate ecological challenges, not only in open, but also inclusive way. And um, in order to answer this question, uh, or find an answer how to answer this question, we start to work with a term called cultural imaginary. And for us, it is a multidisciplinary, non hierarchical and holistic knowledge construction of how we do and could perceive human impact upon the environment. And therefore, as a reaction to the current pandemic and lockdowns, um, in Dust Institute, we developed a project that celebrates being outside and being together, because also we believe that questions related to the environment um, must be experienced in the surroundings where they have been created which means that the project must happen out of the white box of the protected gallery spaces where such a project projects are usually exhibited. And we also think that only a public, um, open, inclusive and collaborative approach in art can resonate in a way that can help us reconstruct what we call a cultural imaginary. But following this thought, we realized that our approach must be as disciplinary as possible, where art and science meet to celebrate and enhance our relationship with nature. So by locating the project entirely outdoor, we proposed a way to locate public engagements directly in the environment where airborne dust evolved. And um, we tried to formulate the new cultural imaginary 
where airborne dust is understood as a material which is interrelated with other private lifestyles, political choices, and other and all other actions and individual decisions uh, have some kind of impact upon the environment that is to some extent mirrored on composition and amount of airborne dust in the atmosphere. Um, and as I already mentioned, these kind of airborne dusts are mostly invisible and we are not able to perceive them. So therefore, we created a tool that is uh, able to lift our perception and help us imagine what kind of invisible particles are floating all around us. So together with atmospheric scientists from Technical University in Vienna, we developed this device uh, that, is, that uh, successfully transformed invisible airborne dust into tangible um, aesthetics and artistic objects. And this device is called Dust Catcher. Um, and dust catchers were inspired by the scientific method of uh, amb ambient air sampling. And it's the method where pollutants carried by air are captured on a medium, usually in various types of fabric, and analyzed later to determine the amount and composition of airborne particles. And um, the dust catchers are basically foldable, fully recyclable instruments that are designed to visually inform communities what kind of dust, if any, is uh, dominant in the air we breathe. Um, so the dust catcher can be delivered to anyone as a simple kit, and the kit contains a dust catcher. It's this one, which can be easily popped out from the cover of the kit, and it contains the nanofabric, uh, like this, the nanofabric filter and the string to attach the dust catcher to any anywhere where, where the participants want. Um, and the nanofabric inserted uh, into the folding paper device materializes the particulate matter by um, collecting dust particles from the environment and it transforms otherwise invisible airborne dust into visible and tangible objects. And after the collection, the color gradient, which is part of the device, might be used to identify the type of collected dust. It's this part here. Um, but to find the proper collection place, the participants need to consider the wind direction, since the wind is a carrier of airborne dust. And uh, placing the device on the breathable level for a few days ensures that the collecting, collected dust is a good representation of dust particles um, we inhale. Um, so we organize the dust collection workshops for school kids which are basically a outdoor educational gathering to collect uh, airborne um, airborne dust from the environment. Um, they first receive an introduction, what is an activity about, what is the airborne dust, what implication it has for their body and the, and the environment. And uh, through folding the dust catchers, we collectively try to raise awareness about the topic. But during the summer months, we also organized um, dust collection walks um, in uh, several Viennese districts. I mean, this is still with the school kids. Um, and we always try to be uh, as inclusive as possible. So we plant, uh, for example, the roots, where you can see here is always as a barrier free with uh, five to six stops per one walk, while having the walking distance about two kilometers. We also checked our activities on mobile devices, on a tracking app to somehow collect information about our walks and the collecting stations. Um, and the collection stations with dust catchers were chosen according to our presumptions of the prevailing dust in the environment. So let's say in the park, we expected to collect more pollen or mineral dust and in the busy road intersection, more, into, more like a black carbon. But we've been not only walking, we've been observing, talking to each other. Um, and basically each station we choose was uh, dedicated uh, to a discussion about different topics about dust. And as a guidance for the workshop, we created a flyer or a tutorial how to contact such a workshop. So each station were dedicated to a discussion about different aspects of airborne dust. We talk about, for example, human-made particles, 
then about dust as a global ecosystem or known as Staubosphere, or how airborne dust affects our body. And in between this discussion, we also conduct simple breathing exercises together to somehow unblock our senses to be able to better feel the environment. So the breathing exercises were focused on unblocking the nostrils and allow senses located in our noses to be better tuned towards uh, towards the smells that are carried by airborne dust particles. And you can see you can see the exercises here. And um, then we compared individual collecting sam collected samples. Uh, we've been smelling different surfaces and somehow slowly attuning our bodies back to the environment. And after the walk, we collected all samples and created a dust calendar of Vienna, showing a different um, airborne dust particles collected during our summer activities. But um, additionally, after gaining this kind of basic knowledge of what airborne dust is and what implication it has for our society, culture, the environment, for the human body, we also try to uplift our perception of the airborne dust even more. Um, and we designed a bodily experience, or we tried to design a bodily experience of air pollution, air pollution and tune our senses even more in order to feel the invisible airborne dust, which is usually represented by data only. So this outdoor uh, interactive installation, which we call Dust Free Chambers, um, translate this abstract data about air pollution into interactive experience between the human and the environment. So what are these devices? So Dust Free Chambers are huge filtration machines. Uh, basically, every molecule of air inside these devices is processed through high-tech nanofilter that, coach, that catch all invisible particles. And the volume of each chamber accuates to the number of liters of air that the human body processes within one day. So there is this uh, relation between the, between the design and the, and the human body. Uh, moreover, the air inside is exchanged every 21 seconds, leaving the indoor settings uh, free of uh, all airborne dust, pollen, scents, and of course, viruses. And uh, this was one of our public intervention in Museumsquartier in Wien this year in summer. And uh, the guided meditation inside the dust free chambers aim to attune our senses and shift our awareness about air we breathe. So simple imagi imagination exercises accompanied with uh, breathing technique techniques um, decongest the nostrils of the visitor and allow one to uplift of sensorial perception of the individual. Mm. The soft surfaces in the instruments somehow invite the visitor to get really comfortable and enjoy the unique audio sensual experience inside the dust free chamber. And after the meditation, what is happening is that uh, one could really feel the difference in sensorial perception between the air within the chamber and the casual outdoor environment. The feedback received from people mostly being like, oh, inside the chamber, um, we uh, we breathed it, the air was more light or the breathing was uh, more easy and when we step out the air is suddenly more heavier and we get a headache um, and as the installation is about uh, breathing and being aware of own senses we also did a breathing performance inside the dust free chamber to somehow represent the breathing te techniques which are happening inside as a special uh, as a spatial artistic uh, performance. And so what's next, right? I mean, as a young researchers and architects or even activists, we of course deal with uh, struggles, especially how to finance and continue working with these kind of projects. But we somehow try to develop this, I really call it a public program, in a way that uh, it can be done by anyone and anywhere. So the dust catchers uh, can be sent anywhere in the world and the dust chambers can be sent as a simple backpack because if you pack the installation, it's just like a simple backpack. 
and it can be done by anyone who is interested to inflate it uh, in the backyard or, or or in the school or in a public space and to anyone who tries to somehow raise awareness in the community about the quality of air we breathe. So thank you. This was my talk or a lecture or or presentation of what we've done so far and I'm really really happy to hear your comments and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was uh, it, it was very impressive uh, for me and um, I think that there were uh, two two parts that uh, uh, it really touched me as the the one where you decided to mount the first uh, intervention or uh, art yes. installation on the um, on the ventilation from the uh, from the city on the subway, uh, yeah, and uh, and how it affects to you, like uh, personally and on, on your health. I mean, um, this is probably something uh, that we should not do because of ethical reasons, right? As, as an art installation, but it's. It just makes very clear, right? Like uh, how it actually affects you, because we yes. we 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 live there, right? And we stay in the subway, and uh, and um, I, I conducted some measurements, and other scientists did the same in the subways, and you have really high levels of particles, exactly. and there are metal particles, you know, yeah. and, and we spend many time there, right? So so it, it just makes it so clear like how air pollution uh, affects us in our day life and and then uh, also like the this um, uh, dust free meditation uh, chambers and uh, and what you said no that the people was entering there and then going out and then they could just yeah. feel like how yes. different is the air right because we are we're just used yes. <laughs> just to breathe it right just to smell it and uh, and 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 it gets with some of the comments that were the people uh, with within the COVID, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, especially during the first wave and the lockdowns, where uh, a lot of people was at home, there yeah. was uh, less traffic, and some of the comments of people was like, "Well, we could we could hear the birds again. The air is smell different." So. Sarah. Thank you. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yes. And um, I found it absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And I've oh. I've it resonated with a couple of projects that I've got at the moment in Nairobi. Um, and I was really interested if you could maybe talk a little bit more about the meditation exercises you did. Um, because and the reason I ask is because we have a project that's on lung health in um, mm. Nairobi with youth and um, we've we really struggled initially in the piloting exercises with kind of getting people to think about what we meant by lung health and breathing. And so we did exercises where we had them running a little bit and or some yoga to get them kind of grounded in their bodies. So I would really, yeah, I'd really welcome any, yeah, any more insight into those meditation activities you use to get people aware of the feeling of the breath coming in out, out yeah. their body. I mean, um, this meditation practice was basically inspired by by practicing meditation. I mean, there is no other way how to do it. And to design a meditation practice, especially for kids or for the wide public, I mean, there is this like uh, very, very like little gap to somehow make the meditation accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. And in the same time, as professional as possible, that even someone who is doing meditation on a single day, or, or like every day is still able mm -hmm. to join the yes. practice. So this is like the kind of like the the, the struggles we've been dealing all the time. And of mm. course, like the length of the meditation, mm. right? Because I mean, the meditation practice, it, sh it should really last, right? Yes. But uh, we did it in six minutes. Okay. Which we found that it's, uh, that you can still basically be attentive to the practice. Mm. And we design it with, uh, we designed it like a very interactive. So we basically enter the structure and the structure, the dust chamber is starting to talking to you. Hey, I'm the dust free chamber. Mm. If you have a look around me and we start to really explain what the, ch mm. what the chamber does. So basically there is this impersonal impersonalization of the structure. Mm. And then uh, the, the structure says like, okay, now close your eyes and listen. 
Okay. And now we will go step by step. Like mm -hmm. first, like a simple imagination technique, then three or four uh, rounds of deep breathing. Then again, imagination technique. Like now you imagine you are a single particle in the air. How you travel from Sahara, Sahara Desert to mm. uh, to um, Amazon forests. Okay. And then again, like the breathing technique, again, some imagination. And uh, the comments of people are like, yes, it's it worked. But on the other hand, if we have someone who is really working with meditation as a daily practice, it was just like, ah, mm -hmm. I see more. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the key is to have always uh, two versions, you know, one yeah. from one who have this experience because we are we are able to do like this kind of like high quality professional practice. Mm. But someone is um, joining us who never done meditation before. This is enough because like six minutes of meditation to being attentive on your own body. It's an extraordinary thing. Yeah, if you've not <laughs> yes. done it before, so, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and, and as I said, like if if you try to be as inclusive and possible you know, as possible, I mean, um, single version of meditation doesn't work. Mm. I have another question. Is that okay, Nuria? Yeah. Of course. Um, <laughs> um, so it's it's about the actual um, dust collectors. Um. So how? Do they fill up? So like if you, so on your walk, when you were talking about how you walked around for two kilometers and you, you put them at different spaces, mm. how long, did you have like five different ones? Cause you did five stops. So you put one up yeah. for a period of time yeah. and then you took it back with you and then you put another one up, did you? Is that how it worked? Well, basically we went for a walk and we placed the dust catchers on the five yeah. different places. Great. Then we waited for a week and then in okay. Okay. locations. Okay. Okay, cool. But oh, most, great. Yeah, I mean, okay. to my surprise, I mean, we did it during the summer and we've collected basically nothing hmm. because it was so clean. The environment was so unbelievably clean during the summer in Vienna that even the measurements were showing zeros in the particle meters. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so. it's. Uh, I, I will not be surprised. It's. It's. Uh, it's it, that's. Uh, that's normal. Yeah. Like uh, probably you 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 get more there like the coarse particles like yeah. that uh, and uh, and that's more on winter like uh, there is like this dust resuspension and uh, and winter you should be able to yes in winter this is like heavily polluted even I feel it when I go out you mm -hmm. know I somehow get sensible I don't know and I can really tell you like during the winter I not even do outdoor activities because it's uh, it's just not not nice to breathe that air. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we did it in in Norway, not not with um, dust catchers, of course. It was mm. a little bit not so not so pretty, um, but with paper and Vaseline. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, and so then that's... we yeah we could also see visually like and uh, and visual and and the kids were able to count the the particles and then from there assess mm. how polluted is the mm. is the mm. air in a in a scale. Mm -hmm. So, okay. but I, I I was wondering because you you mentioned that um, you you in, you took the inspiration to create this method on uh, the the analytical methods that we use in the labs. Uh, did you send some of the samples uh, to the lab? Were they and if so, were they able to to use them to to analyze them? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, they analyzed that and uh, to my surprise, we do not only discover like there are these uh, particles of airborne dust or air pollution, but also microorganism. A uh, lot of microorganisms which get settled there and start growing and start uh, inhibiting the filters. And that's also the inspiration how to continue the project. Like we will not only look in this in an inanimate uh, or particles of dust, but also on the microorganism, which mm -hmm. probably fly on them or something, because I mean, there were basically more microorganisms collected on the nanofiber, on these nanofiber textiles than the dust. So right. that was really surprising for me. It's interesting. Yeah. And um, so. So you 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 mentioned that uh, it is possible like uh, for others to 
kind of like replicate to bring these experiences uh, in how uh, I, I think like um, personally like also like like Sarah I also have some projects uh, like I was mentioning to you before in in Poland mm -hmm. like uh, that's uh, highly polluted here in Europe and I think it will be so interesting um, to to have some of those and um, uh, I like the idea of the walks, you know, like walking to school with the kids and then mm -hmm. having this like uh, different stations where you talk about what cell pollution, you listen to them. I mean, it's like it's really reflective, right? It's not like you, you just see a measurement and then yeah. but you walk, you talk, you understand, then you come back on the next week and you see your results and that's really empowering. Yes. Right, and then you talk yeah. about them, like if they are clean or not, and the difference between summer or winter. It's like yeah. it's really empowering. Yeah, and also the the fact we should not forget. I think when we are trying to do some citizen science, like these are the tools what kids are making. You know, they do it with their own hands, and therefore they create somehow the relationship with the device. Mm -hmm. So they are really somehow then attached to it and go back to check it because if mm. there was something that is already like ready-made and just give it to, to, to the kid like hey just hang it it's something mm. different if the kid is really like trying mm. to fold i mean it's not easy to fold it to be honest you really need to spend some time you know to kind of like uh, do the old parts together and to put the nano fabric uh, precisely and therefore i mean then they really place it carefully mm. you know really try to somehow or they I, I think that it, they always somehow build a relationship with the, with the object that they really come back and check it mm. so that they not they not forget it i was thinking because we're doing walking interviews in nairobi at the moment so we've got we're talking asking people to take us to a place where they feel they can breathe easily and a place where they feel they can breathe mm. hard um, it's harder to breathe and we're taking so we, we've got a purple air with us to actually give us some quantitative measurements mm -hmm. of air pollution but I mean these would be amazing to be able to get someone to stick up one as you say yeah. Nuria on the pla their place they could stick it up on their place and then come back to check it would be absolutely fantastic I, th I really love the visual that visual cue for people I think it's uh, really really nice so important yeah. for people no and I think here is I think very important to mention like what we also all, always try to do in this institute is somehow transform something which is uh, excluded from the society, like air pollution, to something nice mm. that people are just attentive to. Mm. Because if you have like very nice object or something which is nice, nice in your hand, you you are immediately starting to be more interested in it just because it's it is an aesthetic object. So therefore saying to transform air pollution into like aesthetics objects or artistic objects is something that how we can build relationship to with it and uh, be more attentive to this uh, to this issue. So therefore I think this is important or this is like where the really the artistic approach is coming in to somehow turn this negative connotation of air pollution into something which is actually visually appealing. I mean, it's yeah. very contradictory, but in a way, it how how our our brain is working. <laughs> yeah, true. You had this this calendar, right? Like, yes. uh, have have you tried to to make this uh, this calendar like um or like uh, the with the with the kids at the school, like they they make their own kind of like art projects and. Uh, yes, of course, but we need funding. We cannot <laughs> yes, know. It's like so time con consuming and of course schools want everything for free. Yeah, they and also are struggling with budget. Yeah. I mean, we have lots of ideas how to bring this project forward, but I mean, there are these limitations and that's the our time and uh, how we can support financially the activities. This is basically the, the struggle. Yeah, and I think it's really challenging for arts crossover projects, isn't it? Because it's like, do you go for seek arts council type funding or exactly. the science exactly. kind of science bits, in which case, you know, are they happy with the kind of engagement? But I, I feel I feel like the art science crossover is becoming 
a lot more fundable like people yes. like re research it, councils at least it, in the uk uh, are wanting to fund it yeah. more yeah it's somehow growing and i mean there is like one open call exactly about citizen science in vienna at the moment but it's just one you know mm. like mm. you either get it or not yeah mm. and, i mean but this is something which is still like emerging i would say so i would say like in a couple of years this is gonna be maybe even more funded than uh, artistic or scientific projects because it's so important yes yes it is because uh, i mean like um and that's also like why citizen science is important right it's like uh, you you need ways to to connect it to connect with with the with the people right it's like uh, you cannot always do uh from the top policies from the top to the bottom and force things it's if the people understand more, right, and uh, and um, and how to communicate this understanding, that's really important. I mean, mm. because we communicate data on air pollution, right? But does it get to the people? You know, mm. like maybe if someone is very inter interested. But this type of other artistic explorations, where you feel it inside, right? Mm -hmm. You you feel it. Then, I, I mean, that makes. You say it yourself that that change you yeah. when you are able to feel it. And then it's like, oh, wait a second. I deserve a better air than this one. Right. It's mm -hmm. like, then it's when people get empowered and it's wants to do some changes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we had some question from uh, uh, Martin. Yes, Nuria. Uh, hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, Adam, um, sorry, uh, I, I managed to miss your presentation because, you know, we're starting the, the semester and, and presential semester and then as soon as I free the students, I just join. But um, I'm very attracted from the perspective of a uh, artistic uh, approach. And I tell you one of our experiences, right? So we have been executing and coordinating projects with the municipalities, especially in the west coast of Ireland and some states in, in, the, in the US. And uh, we, we discovered that when we deploy smart devices, you know, like uh, pollution particles, in the beginning, creates a, a very good attraction. Like, uh, oh, people get surprised or get, get awareness. I, I think the word is awareness. And then after a while, they become to be like, oh, again, the same particles. Or oh, even though they already are aware, even though they already know it's, it's a, a pollution and they are getting affected, uh, I think it's human brain, right? So. You, you adapt and you say, OK, one more or again. Uh, I was just thinking uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on how the artistic approach can help to keep alive this feeling of awareness without going into this uh, comfort of, OK, I'm still breathing this one, but I have to do it because it's my daily life. No, maybe uh, I'm just thinking, right? Uh, maybe with the artistic approach, we can keep alive or renewing the feeling of damage and then people will be be uh, acting to towards that because uh, I, I don't know if that happens to in other projects with Nuria or or starting you in, in Nairobi and in other countries, but at least in these cities that we are working on, the smart devices are still there, the measurements are still going bad, but people are not really reacting. I mean, they they are aware, they know, uh, and they they becomes to be usual for them. Like okay, now it's uh, again polluted or even more, and they start to get used to that. So. Maybe an artistic approach, instead of transforming the the pollution into something attractive, the message can be via arts to create, keep awaken, awaken this feeling of uh, I have to do something. Can you elaborate on that or you have some ideas that maybe uh, can share with us? Yeah, I mean, this is the part where the art is basically working to support uh, the project in somehow the personal experience. You know, because like if you talk about smart devices, what they do, they just provide data and data are for people or yes, they are excited because they see the numbers. But in after a while, they are like so abstract for the people or for every for like the community that uh, we are not able to with our brains, which are ancient brains that we are not able to process it. And as you as you also mentioned, like the people are losing the interest is that that we still need to basically attune our own bodies to the environment we are currently living in. And this is basically why we designed the dust free chamber, 
that we do not show how polluted the air is or not providing the negative experience, but basically the positive one. And this is where the technology also kicks in because it's like very low tech. It's just basically an air filtration. But it provides you with basically the feeling of how what kind of impact we are having on the environment from the negative perspective. So from this kind of like meditative, very calming experience of dust free environment, you are able to tune your senses whenever you like, basically. I'm always doing it when I'm inflated because I'm like, OK, so yes. And and then, I mean, this is what I also told to Nuria, like I really developed the sense of uh, feeling, feeling the air pollution. Just to know how the dust environment feels like that it's somehow back in my brain already. And I really can say when I'm stepping outside of my apartment in the morning, if. If the air is OK or not, so yeah. it's, it's really possible, but you really need to you really need you need, need to have the sensation of it, the personal experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks for that. So uh, in, in, in the past, uh, uh, we published a, a chapter in, 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 in a book that is called Smart Dust Mesh Based Network. And, uh, you know, with the miniaturization and the evolution of technology from sensors that are we used, used to be very big, now are becoming to be mm -hmm. uh, microscopic and, and we are expecting to have nanoscopic sensors in in few years to come. And my dream has been always since I was uh, uh, young in, in, the, in the studies uh, to have a, a, a minimal elements that can be traced uh, over the over the air, over the space, over everywhere, you know, like and then you can trace back where exactly these particles are coming from. And in this in this book, uh, uh, we are proposing precisely this uh, mesh network of dust mm -hmm. uh, as a smart network. Uh, and the intelligence that this can bring to many systems will be ideal. But um, uh, I'm approaching you because probably one idea will be to, to combine this uh, smart dust concept with some artistic to yeah. create this impact, right? Because the smart dust uh, is, the, is the next wave uh, in, in sense of networks because at the end it's technology plus science uh, plus arts, yeah? Uh, and then uh, hopefully we can stay in contact because I put the link in the in the chat. If you have a, a time, just, just have a look and if you see something interesting or something that we can evolve because it's, it's just a concept right at the moment is yeah. it's a concept but this how the sensor networks are moving towards min miniaturization connecting all the devices connecting all the all the dots and in this case as smart dots will be the minimal particle we're talking about nano uh, nano particles you know like uh, mm -hmm. you will not even see them same as, as the dust but in this case will be connected will be traceable will be and i i'm just, just imagine how uh, uh, technology can work, but uh, from your angle, from your perspective or artistic approach, maybe we can create something additional to this concept. And, and I would be very interested obviously, to, to, to build a collaboration, maybe a project and maybe submit a proposal, something that you see uh, ways to, to exploit this idea from different uh, angles, like, like artistic or even more uh, human centric, because you know, I'm coming more from the technology side, uh, more the technical uh, team, but always attracted to this uh, uh, science. And uh, the reason I am here as well is because we have a citizenscience.ie, is a citizen science organization in Ireland that brings together all the, the, the practitioners, uh, universities, schools, uh, colleges to, to show that how the technology can be used for also not only uh, provision science, but also to collaborate, to create more attraction and involve students, right? So uh, hopefully you see interest in this smart dose mesh based IoT. And, mm -hmm. and we can talk in, in the future. I will put also my contact uh, details uh, in, the case, in the chat and, and hopefully we can talk in the, in the future, short future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, hey, Costas, you wanna... You're, you're muted. Uh, so, hello everyone. Sorry for joining. I, I had most probably a wrong time in my calendar no, yeah i know it's been my fault uh same as like um it's usually we have these meetings from 11 to 12 i was telling adam and um uh, i made a mistake in the first emails and invitations and i put all the time from 10 to 11 and i only realized today and i thought it was uh yeah <laughs> so no, no too, problem uh so, so, so hello everyone uh, sorry for jumping in late, but I was very much, let's say, uh, I was very much triggered by the the part of the discussion that, that I caught 
especially concerning the artistic and the non, let's say, conventional way of uh, uh, presenting environmental information. We have been playing around with this idea and I had the, the luck of uh, collaborating with some master students on this more than 10 years ago, where we tried to, um, uh, to investigate what happens if uh, uh, one uh, uh, uses uh, multimodal communication and uh, uh, other types of, let's say, multimedia uh, means of uh, presenting environmental information in an unconventional way. So let's, let's say in bullet points, I very much agree that uh, numbers say nothing to people, first of all. Uh, so uh, I'm very much interested from the point of view of a person that can also design a, a product, an information product that will be consumed. So let's put it this way. Uh, the consumer is not interested in numbers. The consumer is interested in whatever information can be directly interpreted in everyday quality of life aspects that are easily understandable and interpretable and uh, uh, applicable to reality. In this, on the basis of this concept, uh, if if we agree on this, or let's let's agree for the sake of the of the discussion, let's say, then the next question is which are the means that we can use? And our experience is that uh, it, is, uh, it is always uh, beneficial to try to apply multiple different angles and approaches. So from tangible experience, from noise related experiences, from experiences having to do with the design of open spaces that emit, so to speak, information, either metaphorically or really emitting information. But uh, I think that we should, first of all, get familiar, and this is where the artistic, let's say, part comes into play, get familiar, more familiar with uh, the current modern languages of human communication, whatever this means, and whatever this uh, is as part of content. So it's not always the traditional verbal content, but also, you know, graphs, etc. And also take into account many, very many aspects like culture. I can give you a very simple example, and it's 20 years old. 20 years ago, uh, all, uh, ago we uh, uh, experimented with uh, a project that that time uh, wanted to emit, you know, SMS messages for air pollution. Nuria knows very well all these, uh, let's say, old approaches. And what we, uh, um, and it was a project where we were together with Nilu, Nuria. Uh, 20 years ago. So what we realized is that different cultures play a role. For instance, the French colleagues were in favor of, I remember this, of a voice server. Why? Because uh, France Telecom, the partner back then, said that, you know, the voice server used to be quite popular for people. Uh, Scandinavian people were not in favor of, of verbal communication means. Um, the same or the same image, we, we try to play around with the, these simple images, you know, let's say a red face representing high pollution values. It, the degree of how much this is interpreted as threatening differed in accordance to culture. We realized that when this was discussed for the Mediterranean countries, people said no problem. And uh, when we went towards the north, people said, come on, this is threatening, this is threatening. OK, why? It's not, you know, it, it's just a matter of culture. Uh, it's, it's a matter of how much color we are used in using. Have you ever seen the mobile device, the screen of a mobile device of a young teenager in Japan? It, that it's pink and so the, the, the number of colors and the the brightness of the colors, and these are being used to emit information of various types. So if we don't take this into account, I think that uh, uh, we are losing, let's say, a valuable part uh, percentage of the customer's body to be cynical and engineer at the end of the day. OK, so although we are working a lot with, uh, you know, the computational intelligence part in order to improve sensor, improve uh, sensor performance with modeling, etc. 
like things that Nuria is doing. But at the end, when we are designing services, we need something new. And I think that this our group has, let's say, a very good opportunity to investigate and discuss this and also structure this as a type of, if you like, best practices, not suggestions, just best practices, things that we have seen that might work or we would like to experiment with at the end of the day. Why not? I, I will send you at the end this one of the old papers where and it, uh, the last comment from my side, I personally found it really interesting and it helped me a lot to collaborate with a person that had a completely different background. So the co-author of this paper and the lady that was back then our master's student had a background in design and architecture. I am a hardcore engineer. 100%, 1000%. For me, the universe is orthogonal only. <laughs> it's black and white only. Okay? It's the way that I'm thinking. I'm one of the many human beings. This was another human being bringing in a completely different approach that, you know, and then you, you have your eyes open and you say, come on now, that's nice. That's something new, a new angle on the problem. So I think that we should go for it. Sorry for being too, <laughs> too, 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 uh, uh, too, too underlining all this, maybe too much. Thank you, Kostas, for this um, uh, insight. I, before I leave, uh, maybe Adam to to answer. I just want to say, like, because the meeting today was from ten to eleven, we are actually over time. Uh, so um, maybe, maybe Adam, you want to to say something short on, on Costas, and I don't have any problem on, on leaving this chat um, uh, this chat open. Yeah, thank you, Nuria. I mean, Costas, what you are talking about is basically the lack of interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity in, uh, in uh, the society these days. I mean, this is what I think authorities must this is, you know, like authorities must basically understand, like without interdisciplinary approach to any kind of global, uh, social or environmental issue. Uh, it's not possible to basically do anything. And therefore, I mean, what we are trying to do to really work as interdisciplinary as possible, but it's not easy because we are not supported in a way that we should work interdisciplinary because this work, as you said, for most of the people is black and white. And it's just difficult to find a way of collaborating with people which are basically working interdisciplinary. And therefore, I mean, I also joined this group because of this, because I strongly believe like the interdisciplinary is something that could bring us forward to either solve problems or just get another perspective. So this is, I think, extremely important, important topic to address. Hey, I will, uh, I will just, um, I will just stop now uh, recording because I say we're still re recording, and um, just let me just do that, okay?